I'm going to assume that not everyone is very, is real familiar with this, and I'm going to assume as well that not everyone on the call saw the webinar that I gave, what was it, last week, the week before last, on um, what, March 7th, gave a webinar about the state, uh, an update on the state plan coordinate system. So I'm going to take a little bit of time at the beginning, even though, as you can see, I don't even have a title slide, but I'll take some time at the beginning to go through some of that, some of the concepts and things like that. But I'm going to go sort of fast. Um, I think probably the biggest benefit here will be able to have some sort of dialogue, um, some sort of discussion about things, any questions you have, comments, concerns, that sort of thing. And with that, let me just get started. As everybody knows, there's going to be a new state plane coordinate system to go along with the new terrestrial reference frame in 2022. Some things are still the same. It'll still be based on the same reference ellipsoid as before, as now. A GRS 80, and the same three conformal projection types, Lambert conformal conic, transverse mercator, and oblique mercator. So all that part's the same, but some, there will be some differences. Now, a lot's been going on with state plane. Um, actually, it's been almost exactly a year since uh, we really kicked this thing off. Uh, March 6th of last year, uh, put out a report about the history and status of state plane and a little bit on its future directions. Then gave webinars on March 8th and April 12th, and now uh, this year on March 7th. Um, launched some new uh, state plane web pages on March 19th of last year. Then we did, we put together a draft policy and procedures and published those as well, along with a federal register notice on April 18th. Those are out for several months and people had till August 31st to give their comments and Idaho was one of the states that gave some comments. And so we got that kind of input to help us decide where to go with, with the state plane coordinate system of 2022. And we started making some preliminary design maps as well in October, October 11th for the first ones we put out last year. I'm still working on that, adding to that. In fact, I just made some today for Idaho. And we're in the process of finalizing the policies and procedures. That's going on right now, and uh, March is about over. I still don't have those out yet, but I think they'll be out next week, um, unless they should be out next week. It's essentially done, and we'll have an announcement for that. Now, there's some deadlines that go along with this state plan business in terms of people getting what they want for their state. Um, and I know this might be kind of confusing sometimes, but it's basically, basically a two-step well, it can be a one-step or two-step process. Um, uh, if, you, if you make a request of us to do something for you, make a request that NGS makes some designs for you, say you want something particular for Idaho's statewide zone, which we will design, but maybe you want something particular. And I've, I've gotten that kind of feedback from Idaho. You have till March 31st of 2019. Oops, that's a, that's a typo on there. You know what? I, that is so bad. Hang on. Let's make that a year later. Those were December before. Ah, that's better. Okay, you have to March 31st, 2020 to make a request. And then if you want to do your own design, say for low distortion projections, because NGS won't do those, you don't have the resources, you have a, a, another year yet. But first, for those, you submit a proposal to us. We review it, and if it looks okay, we say, yes, that sounds good. And then then you have till March 31st, 2021 to submit your, your design based on that approved proposal. And, you know, some people are getting a little wigged out about some of that. One thing um, for states that can't get all that done in time, you'll still be able to make changes to your state playing system after 2022. So it's not like it won't be the end of the world. Um, people will, you'll still be able to get changes in there. I realize that this may be a lot of work, and just because it popped in my head, a lot of that work is not necessarily technical in nature. Uh, a lot of it is getting people to agree. That might be the slowest part for a lot of states, getting everyone to get on the same page, all the stakeholders, if you will, get on the same page about what they want for their state. That probably takes the most, or could take the most time. So the general characteristics for it, um, and this is probably the main thing that makes it differentiate it from state plane 83, which I'll go into a little more detail is linear distortion, that is scale error, the difference between grid and ground is minimized at the topographic surface rather than the ellipsoid surface. And don't worry if you don't quite know what I'm talking about. I have some cartoons to show that. 
And there's other characteristics as well. Default designs, that is, if we don't get consensus stakeholder input from a state, we'll still design zones for you, but they'll be a lot like your state plan 83 zone. We will design a statewide zone, statewide zone and you can also have zone layers, a little more on that as well. Um, hmm, I have that on there, maybe I should, well, you'll see it. Positive east longitude, don't worry about that too much right now, talk about it in a bit. A low distortion projections are allowed, and special use zones, that's another thing that's a zone that's in more than one state for a special application, like uh, Yellowstone National Park, it's in three different states. If they want, if a system was, if they had a good enough use case for their own state playing zone, because they are in three different states, it would be a special use zone. Now here's the situation, not this blue, let me see if I can make this look like a laser pointer. There you go. This is supposed to be the Earth, this blue curve, Earth ellipsoid. And this green line cutting through it, you can think of as a, as a projection surface on edge. It could be a plane, it could be the cross section of a cylinder or a cone, but in one, in one direction it's flat. And part of the reason they're called projections because you can think of it as a light bulb at the center of the Earth, say, and it's shining light out like these rays right here, and it's projecting this ellipsoid distance onto the plane. Right? And so you can see that the distance on the plane is longer than that distance on the surface of the Earth, in this case, the surface of the ellipsoid. The opposite is true over here where the distance on the grid distance, projected distance is shorter than the ellipsoid distance. And this is the typical situation. In fact, this is how State Plane 83 and State Plane 27 were designed. It's how UTM is designed, all those things. And it looks just like this, where most of the width of your zone, your grid distances are short, right? Because you can think of the projection surface being below the ellipsoid surface, and then it's longer, they're longer on the outside, but this is a sm much smaller area of the zone, these parts on the outside. Problem is, uh, people don't map or survey on, on the ellipsoid, they survey on the ground. So what we're going to do for State Plane 83 is essentially just design the projection so that um, the, the bubble surface coincides as best as possible with the topographic surface. And the situation is just like, like, like I'm showing here, I've got you can see that the grid distance would be nominally the same as the ground distance there, but really it, it, it varies, obviously. The only place where they're really the same is where that developable surface, the projection surface, cuts the topography. So there's sort of one point there where they're the same. And there's one over here, and this might not even be in the zone, somewhere out to the east, say. But the whole idea is, is really pretty simple. Just minimize that difference at the ground surface rather than the ellipsoid surface. And what this slide is implying is that we would just take every state plane 83 zone if we do it by default and we just apply a scale factor to get it at ground. Well, it, it's not that straightforward. Actually, we'll do something a little more specialized. For every zone, we'll instead also recompute the projection axis location so we can get that developable surface to coincide better with the topography in the case where there's some sort of topographic slope across the region, which could be even state size. Then when you do it this way, you have a whole bunch of points that have a low distortion, near zero distortion, and you have lower variation overall. So the, this cartoon shown the overall approach that we're using for State Plane 2022, to minimize linear distortion at the topographic surface of the Earth. Even though for large zones, you're still gonna have significant distortion, we'll see that for Idaho. Uh, well, this slide, just to give you some idea with numbers, there's a table over here that gives you distortion in parts per million. A part per million is a millimeter per kilometer. So what this is saying that if we go down to say 10 parts per million, that means that the ground distance differs from the projected distance by one centimeter per kilometer. Okay, that's one, oh, 10 millimeters per kilometer. And 20, parts per, and 20 parts per million here, two centimeters per kilometer. So that's just the difference, right? The linear distortion, and it goes up as you're going down this table, it gets greater. What this column is showing is how wide your zone can be to achieve that distortion. It turns out your zones can be pretty big if you have no topographic relief. 
you go down all the way down to here where it says 255 kilometers or 158 miles, that's the nominal width of a state plane zone, which is supposed to give you scale error of 100 parts per million or one part 10,000, but that's at the ellipsoid. This other column shows you how much distortion you get just due to change in topographic height. And in the Western United States, this is a big deal. So I can get, um, I'll go to 20 parts per million here, and 255 meters or 800 feet, basically you get 20 parts per million distortion. That's not a lot of relief out west, right? Yet it corresponds to a 71 mile wide zone if there is no topographic relief. So there's a lot of interplay here between the width of the zone and the variation in topographic relief. And that's sort of what makes things uh, challenging. Now, as far as default zones go, NGS is doing that because every state has to have a state, have state plane, right? every, states and certain territories. So for a complete system, we have to do it because I'll tell you, we will not hear from some state. That's just, get, that's just the way things are. We won't hear anything. Um, so it'll be a lot like state plane, except it'll be designed so that distortion is reduced at the ground surface. That'll be the basic thing. And in addition, we're also designing statewide zones for every state as part of state plane 83. So there's actually quite a few states that only have a single zone, um, but there's, there's more that have multiple zones. For the ones that have a single zone, we would get, they'd get one zone by default from NGS, which would be their default and statewide zone. In a state, say like Idaho, by default, you'd get your three existing transverse Mercator zones plus one statewide zone designed by NGS. Now, this whole idea that there's more than one projection in the same place is, is new. Well, actually, it's not totally new. A little uh, digression here. There is one state that has layers right now in State Plan 83. It's Kentucky. Kentucky has a statewide zone, which they uh, adopted in 2001, and it became part of State Plan in 2001. But they also have two Lambert conformal conic zones, uh, the classic zones that they'd had in the past. So when you say, um, well, so you can get state plane coordinates for either zone in that state, either layer of zone, the statewide zone, and or the multiple zones of those two Lambert, the two Lambert zones that they have in Kentucky. So we're doing the same thing, except we're doing it nationwide now instead of just one state. So every state will have a statewide zone. And then in the case of say Idaho, Idaho will also get um, the three zones that they already have by default. Now, Idaho could request something different, and we can talk about that. So, but there's a, there's a, a wrinkle in here, um, and this is based on uh, feedback, feedback from our customers and stakeholders. So a state can have multiple zones. Every state will have a statewide zone, but they can also have one or two multiple zone layers. For example, Idaho could have They'll have the statewide zone. They could have their three transverse Mercator zones or something like it. And they could also have a low distortion projection zone as long as it didn't cover the entire state, right? If you just want it for certain um, urban areas and things like that, places where you want low distortion, you could have that in addition to a multiple zone layer that covers the entire state. Did that sound confusing? I'm sure it did. So I'm sorry about that. I have pictures to help make it um, clearer. And the example we have here is Iowa, of a state that will have multiple zones, because we already know what Iowa wants. They let us know. So right now, they have a statewide zone designed by NGS. At least this is a preliminary version of it. And the colors, we'll see more of these maps. Um, the colors on here, obviously, it's for, correspond to this legend. So where it's green, it's plus or minus 50 parts per million distortion about a quarter of a foot per mile. And then the, then the colors show the distortion gets greater as you move as you move towards the center of the state or away from the center of the state. Um, anyway, it's a Lambert formal conic zone, and this is their statewide zone, zone showing this distortion. Now I'm going to change the map here. Actually, I apologize because I should have done something first, but that's okay. Quite what I expected. Okay. It's the same exact zone, only I've changed the color ramp so that it's now the green, or the, the step size, rather, is plus or minus 10 parts per million. You'll see why in a minute. 
So it's showing here in this box that 11% uh, of the state is within 20 parts per million. That's a tenth of a foot per mile. Most people will consider that low distortion. Obviously, a statewide zone does not give them low distortion. However, they also have a or are going to have a system that looks like this. Now I have 14 zones. There's 99 counties and 14 zones for those counties. The boundaries of these zones correspond to the county. And here I have 99.6% of the state covered at 20, 20 parts per million. So you can see there's a very, very low distortion here for the entire state. So this is what they want. Now, oh, this is just, and this is essentially more or less what they get if for a default zone if we didn't hear from them. If we didn't get unanimous input from them saying, yes, we want to have those 14 low distortion projection zones, we would give them something like this, right? Which is their state plane system as it is now. Two zones, two Lambert zones. Now, hopefully this makes sense. So every state's going to get a statewide zone. That's what I'm showing here. You can see them as a base layer. Every single state's going to get that. Iowa says, indicated that they want this a multiple zone layer for the covering the entire state. Or, there's an or on here, or they could have statewide, multiple statewide zones that are like the state plan zone. They can have one or the other of these two on top. They can't have both because it's, actually because there's not a very good use case. If I have a state, uh, multiple zone layer of two, zone, two zones here, would it ever even get used if they have this and this? Probably not. So a decision needs to be made by a state. You can't cover the entire state with, with multiple zones, with two multiple zone layers. It's gotta be one or the other. And to me, that's, I don't know, that's fine. Right? That seems kind of straightforward. So what is up with this third layer? Let me show you, and this applies more to the Western United States um, situation in Alaska. Okay, just like every other state, Alaska is going to get it one gigantic statewide zone, even if as ridiculous as it may seem. Get that kind of coverage. In addition, they could get a an intermediate layer, call it a, a default layer of their state of their existing state planning zones. There's ten of them, right? And they can get that, like shown on here. So I've got both. I've got a statewide zone and a multiple zone layer that covers the entire state. But they could also have a set of low distortion projections shown on here where they don't overlap each other and they just cover parts of the state. This is very, actually, this is what they have right now using internally. They have about, I think, 47 zones covering the state in various places where they need it, but they don't need low distortion projections everywhere. Um, they just need them in some places. So this is a valid setup for states to have three layers. Again, they can only have that third layer if it is discontinuous coverage. And the only reason we're doing that, allowing that really, is to accommodate mountainous western states because it doesn't make sense for them to have low distortion projections everywhere. They can't. The country's not like Iowa. So I hope that makes sense. I know people got confused on that before. Now, real quickly, we'll get into the Idaho stuff here in just the next slide. Um, I just want to tell you about how we design the zones at NGS. We established something called a linear distortion design criterion in these discrete steps of parts per million, 20, 50, 100, whatever. Um, and then the criterion you use must satisfy all of the following criterion. At least 90% of the population is within that criterion, 75% of all cities and towns, regardless of population, and 50% 50, 50 of the entire zone area. So how it works is you choose the lowest design criterion that meets all three of those conditions. So as far as NGS goes, we will design zones for a minimum dis distortion design criterion of 50 parts per million. So for example, I know we say, hey, NGS, could you redesign our zones at 50 parts per million? And we would do that. You might end up with four or five zones instead of three. I'm not sure, we'd have to look at that. Um, and the maximum is 400 parts per million. That doesn't really matter much. Now, in some cases, what we designed would be actually less than 50 parts per million. It depends on how things break out. And obviously, very small states like Delaware, they get low distortion just by default because they're so small. 
And states that want less than 50 parts per million zones, they want these low distortion projection zones, they need to design those themselves if the criterion is less than 50 parts per million. I hope that makes sense. Now, Idaho, beautiful Idaho. Um, right now, this is a, a map I just made today of a preliminary design for the a default design for Idaho West Zone, Transition Mercator Zone. It's just been tweaked to reduce distortion at the topographic surface. And oh, you see the sneaky thing I did there. Look, I have positive east longitude. Isn't that terrible? Um, you can bug me about that afterwards. So we're apparently going to go down that path. People can, well, you can still interchange between what the west longitudes and east longitudes, but I think that's going to be the default. Um, so that's why I'm showing on here. Anyway, for this design, the design criterion is 75 parts per million. And that's chosen because that's the lowest of the, of the standard increments, which is specified, that achieves the criteria I talked before about before. Here I have 96% of population, 86% of cities and towns, and 54% of the entire zone are within 75 parts per million. As far as the map goes, the color ramp, is, the green is showing plus or minus 50 parts per million. But you get the general idea, you can see that the plus or minus 50, and then it's still greenish on either side of that to get to the plus or minus 200. But you can see it's going through some of the more populated areas like Boise, and includes even Coeur d'Alene, stuff like that. Um, but and the, there's a whole process to doing this, and one of them is to minimize the range of distortion in the zone. And the range here is the difference between the maximum and the minimum. It's 449 parts per million for this zone. And the other thing we look at is population and uh, distribution of uh, cities, like I said. For example, on this design, the weighted mean distortion, wait, well, distortion uh, weighted by population is plus five parts per million. So it's very close to zero on here. So again, this is what we do by default, or something similar. I mean, this is just a preliminary design. Now I'm going to show you what existing state plane looks like there. Okay, this is what it is right now in Idaho. If you didn't notice, I'm going to clip back real quick. Watch that central meridian move. So we have it, it moved to the east. Okay. So it's further to the east for state plane 83. And you can see that the range of distortion increased. So you remember that cartoon I showed before where I moved the projection axis to make it better coincide with topography? Well, that's what happened here. Topography is generally a little bit lower to the west in this zone. And so that's all that is. Um, as far as performance goes, you can see it's really poor for population and area and all that, but that's expected, right? State Plane ABC was designed with respect to the ellipsoid, and um, Idaho's high, high elevation, so it's not a real big surprise that this would be the case. So that's it for a default one. I want to talk more about the statewide zone. Um, I, oh, yeah, this is the existing one. You guys already have one, right? I, Idaho, what do you call it? Um, ITM 83, Idaho Transverse Mercator, going with the MAT 83. This is, its, this is how it looks right now. It has, first of all, as a scale, that, actually what it is, you can see something. It's just UTM with a different central meridian, right? Because the UTM is at 117. You can't see it here, maybe in 111, the two standard. UTM, oh, here's 111. 111 and 117, and this one's just in the middle. So basically, it's picked UTM and sh shifted it so that it's centered on the state and used that. And that scale factor is UTM scale. And it does pretty well. 81% 80, 80, of the population, 70% cities and towns, 47% of area for a 400 part per million distortion design criterion, which makes this is not a design, though. This is an existing system. That's why it's not meeting the criteria. If we instead do a design using a transverse mercator, it would look like this. Here, this design's been done. This is how it came up, the 40, came up with the 40, 400 parts per million, which, by the way, does correspond to UTM. Here, we've got essentially 100% of the population, 98% of cities and towns, and 85% of the entire zone. Just with a transverse mercator, with a slightly different, or 15 arc minutes, 
slightly different central meridian location and a somewhat different scale. The scale has been increased a bit from 0.9996 to 0.99987. You can see that um, it performs better in terms of at the topographic surface, which we expect because the previous one really was, even if it was unintentional, it was really meant for distortion at the ellipsoid. So this is a, this might be one that NGS just does automatically, right? Oh, if we didn't get any input. But we did get some input. Um, and what I'm showing up here is the distortion for one that was proposed by, I guess it's the group running this meeting was that G did a control technical working group. They sent, a, sent me a letter, PDF letter, and it had some parameters for an oblique mercator zone for the state. So I went ahead today and plotted up the distortion for it. And it, it performs quite well. I mean, there's some quirks about it that could be dealt with, but you get the general idea. I, I'm not sure exactly how, um, what process was used to select rejection axis location and its azimuth, but we can talk, we can talk more about that kind of process. Um, and I wanted to have more done um, that I wanted to have another alternative to this prepared, and I didn't quite get it done before this presentation. But just looking at this map, and we can toggle back and compare it to the other one, you see it does quite well. I've got, again, 99% of the population, 97% of the and pounds, and 96% of the entire zone area, meeting that 400 parts per million. Actually, you could probably use 300 parts per million as a criterion here. Let me, so looking at this map, and some of these things here, like the range, is a range of 1,190 parts per million. I'm going to toggle back to the um, preliminary design that, that we did um, without the state's input. Okay, so here the, there's, there's a lower range, but not much. It's really not that much different. Slightly lower range, but the other one had slightly better in terms of percentage covered within a certain distortion, within the distortion criterion, but it had larger um, extremes, right? So this one is, the maximum positive distortion is 472 parts per million. And that's occurring here on the, on the eastern edge of the state and here in, in the western edge, especially right in here, okay? Now, if I go back to that proposed draft design, where we're getting the real extremes, and not a big surprise is in the, southwest corner and the northeast corner over here and it's it's pretty big positive 645 versus what was that positive 472 so it's just one of those things now i think the only only slide i have left is a summary slide and that's probably not really that necessary for discussion purposes so one thing i'll say i'll say a little bit more about oblique locators and the design process now, I, when I talked to y'all in the past, um, I, I talked to Kesby in the past, and, you know, just looking at the shape of the state, one would be tempted to choose an oblique mercator, right? Because it seems to lend itself to that. Um, however, when I looked at it more closely in the last couple, few months, I found that, um, what's the best way to say this? Let's stop for a second. Assume that Idaho is flat. I know it's not, but let's just say it is. The best performing projection for Idaho, if it's flat, would be an oblique mercator with a, a skew axis, axis azimuth of negative two degrees. That's awfully close to zero. That's so close to zero that I thought, you know what? It's probably not a good idea to use um, an oblique mercator for the state. However, when you take topography into account, that does change somewhat. And I found that um, negative seven degrees um, will give you the lowest range in distortion for the state rather than negative 18 um, and a slightly different location on that skew axis. So just to give you an idea, so what we're looking at here in terms of adopting a coordinate system, a statewide coordinate system for Idaho is a, sort of a balance between what's the best we could achieve, right? I mean, generally want that, but then there's a point where you go to a more complex projection like oblique mercator and the in, in, in improved performance 
might not quite justify using that more complex projection. Now, computers do all this, so it sort of, sort of doesn't matter. But nonetheless, it, it seems like it might not be quite worth it. But it's right on that boundary, right? Um, now, is, there's one other thing to that that popped into my head. Uh, well, I guess there's a few. But as far as the skew azimuth for oblique mercators in the policy and procedures, the draft ones aren't out yet. You have to be more than um, five degrees off of the cardinal on that azimuth, so you can't uh, you can't have a minus two degree skew azimuth on an oblique mercator because it's just too close to a transverse a regular transverse mercator. Um, there's no point really in you doing that. However, as I said, well, negative eighteen is fine, um, and negative seven seem to give the best performance overall. So it, it is justifiable for the state, but still, it's something to think about, and maybe that's something we can talk about. Right now, I think um, the last thing I'll do here is just I'll quickly summarize everything and then let's have a conversation. Um, so here's it's state plane 2022 characteristics that are different from state plane 83. This is a reminder of stuff, and some of it might not be a reminder. Minimize distortion of the topo surface, not the ellipsoid. NGS will design statewide and default zones. You can have up to three zone layers, and that one of those can include, or that include LDP layer, I'll just say it that way. Special use zones, where I talked about a little bit. Um, one thing I have, haven't said is coordinate changes. The projected coordinates must differ by at least 10,000 meters from state plane 83. Uh, positive east longitude. I, I don't feel that strongly about that. Um, anyway, <clears throat> and stakeholders can request their and propose their preferences. But consensus input is required. And this is an important point here, and, and I wish I'd made it more clearly before in my webinars. There's a list of stakeholder groups in the policy and procedures. It doesn't mean every state, every group has to be represented, because not all those groups even exist in some states, or they're unresponsive. What it means is that every stakeholder that does contact us has to agree. Hopefully they all get together first and then contact us and not contact us separately. That's awkward, um, but not everyone does. So if only one stakeholder contacts us, they carry the day. There's no competition. We would just do, um, well, assuming it, it met policy and procedures, we would do what they ask. Um, so as far as that goes, we don't need to hear from every single stakeholder group, but the ones we do hear from must agree. If they don't agree, we go to the default, or if we don't hear from anyone, we go to the default. And that last bullet to remind you that if, if for those states that can't quite figure out what they want, they can always change, add, or remove zones after 2022. What's nice about that, especially in the mountain states, is um, you could add, uh, let's say you had the discontinuous low distortion projection zones kind of scattered around, and you didn't have time to do very many before 2022, you can add to that later. You can add more to it, and that's perfectly fine. And in addition, or maybe you don't get any of them in by 2022, but after 2022, you add low destruction projection zone. So changes are possible in the future. And that's it. I'm ready to hear what y'all have to say. All right. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Um, I'm walking back up to the desk so everyone can can hear me. And um, what I'd like to do is just open the floor for any questions that folks may have. And maybe since we only have three more people in the room, if folks wanted to roll their chairs up closer to, to have this discussion, that'd be great. Uh, folks, just remember, if you have a question, uh, unmute yourself and then uh, just start talking. Anything, Kazi? Or Dan? Okay. So uh, I have a question, uh, Michael. Um, I, I, I have a society of professional land surveyors. Uh, they are, um, they are um, willing to um, offer a proposal to engineers that they can engage um, instead of existing three zones, they can take uh, 
Oh, okay, Kazi, can you can you move a little closer or, or talk? Yeah. I'm having a little trouble hearing. Sorry. I'll, I'll summarize real quick while he comes closer, but. Um, uh, okay. I don't know if you're aware, uh, Michael, but the ISPLS, the Society, Idaho Society for um, uh, Land Surveyors, is uh, looking at a nine zone system. So essentially taking the three zones that we have that are running essentially north south. Uh, so that's the west that you already showed, central and east, and then subdividing each of those from north south so that there's a um, nine zones in total. Now we didn't, we weren't able to send that to you um, as a proposed draft simply because the um, that draft is not as far along as our uh, statewide IDTM type of thing, and that's simply because there's, you know, there's nine zones instead of one. Um, so, um, <laughs> right. What do you think about that? Uh, just just off the top of uh, just knowing that we had nine zones instead of three. Yeah, and it seems like that sounds familiar. You or someone must have, Kazi might have said it to me before even. So, well, I think um, that's fine. That, that's enough zones that it certainly um, would fall in the low distortion projection realm. It'd be less than 50 parts per million um, in terms of a design criterion from that small. So it would be on the state to design them. And um, I'm gathering from what you just said that that would be nine zones that completely cover the state, right? Everywhere, everything would be covered. So that would be your two layers, right? You would have a yep. statewide zone of some type and you'd have a multiple zone, a nine zone, multiple zone um, layer. And you still could get, if you wanted even lower distortion in certain special areas, you could have discontinuous zones scattered around here and there, um, depending on what you want. But yeah. That would be fine, and and you guys aren't aren't behind on our end, right? We haven't even released the policy and procedures, and um, I didn't say it in here, but there's forms. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible for every the customers and for us. There's a really simple form for when you make your um, request or proposal. And if it's just a request, that's all it takes. Like let's say your statewide zone, you give me a request, you fill out the form. Mm -hmm. I have a copy. And of you get the request. It was from the web. Yeah, and those will be out, like I said, I'm hoping next week. So, and then, or you can take that form and make it a proposal and say, this is what we want to do. And it's real simple. You just say, we want, we're going to do nine zones. You don't need to know anything else, really. Um, and we say, okay, sounds fine. And then you have a whole, you'd have till, whatever I said, March 31st, 2021, to get that design into us for us to check it and all that. So that, that would work, um, if that all makes sense. Yeah, Again, so, assuming all the stakeholders agree. So, um, Stuart, I know Stuart's on the line. I don't know if uh, Tom Ruby's on the line. I know Tom has been kind of leading the charge for ISPLS on this nine zone system. But, Stuart, you're tapped into this very well. Is there anything you wanted to add to this uh, about the nine zone versus three zone? You may need to unmute yourself. Or maybe he didn't get, get reconnected. I don't know. See, and so are those nine zones going to be um, by county boundary or some other kind? Yeah, of by county boundary, yes. Well, there's, there's quite a few more counties in the state than, than just that, but they do follow county boundaries. We're not, uh, yep, the not. proposal does not split a county. In fact, we do have a GIS layer of it, and if the folks at ISPLS are okay with that, I'll go ahead and forward to you the link to the web map uh, that that shows this nine zone system. And just of course understand that it's entirely draft at this point, but I'm sure we'd all like to get your input on that. Yeah, and like I said, I, I mean, conceptually, there would be that, that concept, there's no problem whatsoever. Um, it's just the various details and there's, you know, some details about the design, but the concept's fine. And the details are just technical things and ensuring consistency and stuff like that. And again, the, on the form, when you, there's a form for the submittal, that's where you get into the details. That's where every zone would be defined. And there's little check boxes to make sure you followed all the policy and procedures. And if not, it, you maybe need to ask for an exception. Who knows? Um, so we tried to make that easy and hopefully it will be. Yeah. So uh, I just saw a little chat line from Stuart that he's not, he's trying to talk, but he's, we're not hearing him. 
Um, but he also noted that maybe Tom Judge uh, would like to add something in. Hopefully Tom can talk and we can hear him. I'm not sure if you can hear me or not. I had two two comments or two. Yep, we got One you. Uh -huh. slash comment. Um, this nine zone concept is, is not, as far as my familiarity with it, not going to achieve low distortion projection criteria. So I'm a little surprised to hear that we would be on the hook to design it. And that I have made the comment a few times during comments or during these sessions that it sure be nice as the people that have to carry the legislation at the state level that the board would be considered a stakeholder in this process. So. And, and Tom, the so, board that, you, that you're talking about, what, what's, what, which board are you talking about, Tom? Uh, the Board of Engineers and Surveyors generally carries um, any changes to the state plane coordinate systems at yeah. the state level. They generally run that yeah. as an agency bill, carry that legislation. And that's fine, actually. And so every state's a little different on that, um, Tom. So as far as I'm, as far as NGS is concerned, if the state board has that role, then certainly they would, they'd be a great stakeholder. In fact, it could be the kind of thing where they provide an umbrella for other stakeholders as well, which I think is better. I was surprised, I learned recently that some states, the uh, state geologists, of all people, is responsible for the state plan coordinate system definition in their state. And so it does vary, but what we, the main thing is getting the representation from people that would be construed as stakeholders. So part of the language and the policy is there's always, there's the, the waffly one at the end that says that any other organizations that fulfill the similar, fulfill the purpose of the ones listed here. So the state, the Board of Technical Registration is fine. Now, as far as being on the who has responsibility to design the nine zones, the, the problem is, so I would love for NGS to design all the zones and all the states. Um, we made an arbitrary cutoff of 50 parts per million as the minimum uh, design criterion using those ways of uh, evaluating that. And certainly for nine, that would be, it would definitely fall below that. Um, there's ways to look at that and see, and see wh what the cutoff would be. Um, there's ways to carve up the state maybe that, so it's less than nine zones, I don't know. Um, so that's our, that's our sticking point on there is we, if we start doing that, well, we wouldn't be able to do it for every state and then that would cause problems. What ends up happening though, when you do take, it, take a look at a, at a geographic region, say a state, uh, you can end up with, it's already happened, and in Florida and Maine, uh, stuff we've done there, where they got less than 50 parts per million because you can't have half a zone, right? Once you get down to a certain number, the distortion is usually going to could often drop below the 50 parts per million. The problem with Idaho is it's likely that that number would be less than nine before we hit that tipping point of being um, any smaller, it would be too much of a burden for us to design. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking my way through it, so. <laughs> gotcha. Um, so I would, in this context, um, I would um, request uh, Tom Jazz uh, to propose if uh, uh, um, 10 years that we, we, we might get um, um, a, a low distortion um, projection for uh, so for, for our some important cities like Boise, Pocatello, and, and some other important cities, so that we can have low distortion uh, projection for important cities at the same time. Uh, if nine zones, we reach the decision to for nine zones, um, and it goes the cut of fifty parts per million. Um, Michael is going to do that, so we can have three three things done. One is a statewide, another one is. Um, uh, either the three zones or nine zones uh, to be decided, and then um, LDP uh, for some important cities. Some of some of those special zones. So, uh, yeah, low distortion. Yeah. Uh huh. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, you know the uh, number of the western states are falling into the same situation. We have exactly what we're talking about here is going on in Colorado for sure, and I haven't 
talked directly with the folks from Utah, but I know from, they gave a very nice write up about it in the response to the federal register notice. So I know that, that they're thinking about something similar, uh, maybe using a different zone layout for the continuous coverage of the state and then having dis, you know, discontinuous uh, low distortion projections in areas where they need them, mm -hmm. uh, not everywhere. So, and that's certainly a possibility too. And, and Kazi, you just said that, of course. Yep, that's good. Okay. Well, so, I mean, obviously we're not going to finalize anything today, um, but this is all very, very good uh, information that'll help carry us forward as we um, you know, proceed and try to coordinate all these, um, these activities and get the letter of consensus in prior to the uh, March of next year uh, deadline. 